all systems ready, I guess we should get going. So, um, my name is Vitaly Wool, and I'm gonna talk today about secure updates for memory constrained XIP system. Um, it will happen along the way to uh, decipher what XIP stands for, and there will be some more abbreviations that we'll cover briefly too. Uh, but first of all, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself. Um, now, now, we can see this is a company requirement to have a short slide about myself. I've been talking on ELC since 2010. I have never done such a slide now, I think I should. Uh, anyway, I've been with Embedded Linux since 2003, so it constitutes quite a long time. I uh, started working uh, for Mona Vista uh, in a uh, dedicated team in Moscow, Russia, back in 2003, uh, and in 2009 moved to Sweden, where I continued working primarily in Embedded Linux and Android field. And now being part of the Consulco, I run uh, a small subsidiary in Sweden called Consulco AB and do some development too, yes. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, over-the-air updates, which stands for RDA uh, and XIP systems and how these two uh, go well together or, well, not go well together. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit what OTA actually is, what XIP actually is, how we can make them work together and, yeah, we'll draw some conclusions. I hope to be fast enough uh, to leave more time for questions because usually that's the most interesting part. So, OTA. OTA stands for over-the-air update. There's also an abbreviation FOTA or FOTA, uh, which stands for firmware over the air update. And basically, it's a very simple thing in itself. It means that you don't have to connect uh, the device being updated to any other device physically, but rather uh, the update is downloaded over the air. Uh, and then applied using some special software running on the device being updated. This is nothing new. Um, over there, updates uh, have been around for quite a while. And while well, you probably all know uh, different weird stories about routers updates that turned routers into something completely different, uh, like uh, spamming uh, the network with some malicious data just because the updates uh, were not really secure, uh, they were tempered with, and um, this is not really a nice story. Uh, if we recall all the stuff that happened to routers uh, in 2000, 2010, you know, all these years. So um, even then, people could understand that security is an important thing when it comes to over-the-air updates because there's uh, a lot of stuff that can go on in between. And when it came to mobile devices like your mobile, mobile phones, your tablets, um, iPods, um, the updates over the air became a lot more secure when it came to mobile devices because when a device is leaking your personal data and you can sue uh, the company that issued that update, well, this is something to consider. Uh, so companies became more aware uh, of security concerns because basically uh, they constituted threat for their money. Uh, but that's basically nothing compared to uh, various embedded devices um, of even bigger importance uh, where security plays even bigger role, like for instance, medical devices, uh, some automation, uh, IoT, and the last but not the least, cars. 
So automobile, you really don't want anyone to tamper with your automobile's software. Uh, so uh, it's important to get uh, secure ODA updates on one hand, uh, so it poses a threat potentially, but on the other hand, it's important to develop this functionality because uh, it makes life easier both for you as a user, both for you as a driver, and uh, for the companies and service centers because instead of driving to a service and spending time waiting in line, uh, you just leave your car for 15 minutes and then the update is done anywhere. For IoT devices, like telemetry devices somewhere uh, close to the North Pole, it's even more important because sending a technician to North Pole, well, you know, this is a very costly operation. So if it can be avoided, it should be avoided. And uh, if that device is connected to the outer world one way or another, probably via satellite, then it can download and apply update using that satellite connection and it will be cheaper and faster, at least in theory. Okay. The updaters, now if we're talking about free and open source over the air updaters, there are several that stand out. Uh, I made a list. It's not meant to be complete. It's not meant to be a comparison. I'm just listing the ones uh, that I've been working with, and those are OS3, which is used by AGL and some Fedora distributions, SW Update, which I believe is developed by Denx, and it's um, also widely used, and it has uh, an open embedded Yocta integration, at least in part. AUC, which has a very nice open embedded integration, and I think they're developing it in Pengatronics. And then there's Android Update Engine, and since Android is kind of embedded Linux anyway, uh, I think it makes sense to list it here, uh, especially given that Android was pretty much the first one uh, forcing the AB updates, but we'll get to that. So, um, updater requirements. So in order to uh, avoid situation uh, when you update your uh, favorite device and it gets bricked or starts malfunctioning, there are certain requirements to ODA updates, um, which are listed in this slide. This is again nothing new. Uh, updates should be fail safe. So if something uh, unpredictable happens, like the power is off during the update, it has to revert. There shouldn't be partial updates. There should be a possibility to roll back to a previous software state, which basically implies that there is um, a backup version of the software somewhere. So you have to have two versions of the software at the same time, which may be complicated due to size limitations. Uh, an OTA updater should be capable of updating all software and firmware. You know, in the Linux world, that means bootloader and kernel and root file system and databases and what other data you can think of. And Finally, the last but not the least, it should be secure. So uh, updater should be able to distinguish uh, between the real update, the one that's certified, that's authentic, uh, and the one that's been tampered with, that lost authenticity or integrity, and not apply uh, the updates that it isn't sure about. Um, we're gonna classify ODA updaters a little bit. Um, there are many classifications, basically. We will uh, concentrate on two. Um, by the update method, uh, you can say it's either a single copy or a double copy updater. So as you can see on the picture, 
on the graph down below. If we're dealing with a single copy, uh, then uh, you have to reboot in order to apply an update. So once they update, when the updater patch is there, uh, you need to reboot into the bootloader, which detects that an update should be going on. And then it calls into the software updater, which is abbreviated as SWU uh, in the left uh, rectangle. So, and when it finishes its work, it reboots into the bootloader again. And then the new bright and shiny application software is there to be started. In case we were dealing with a double copy, uh, the first currently running application software should have an updater application, basically, uh, which would then uh, apply update uh, to the standby copy. So if we're working off of the software B, uh, it will update the software A and then reboot the system uh, letting the bootloader know that it should now uh, start the software A. So now we're starting the software A, and that's the bright and shiny new one. And we also have a software B as a backup copy. Uh, the second classification uh, has some relation to the first one, of course, uh, but it's concentrating mostly um, on the execution context of the updater. Uh, so first of all, uh, in case a reboot is required to uh, apply the update, it can happen uh, using a special kernel and RAM disk, initial RAM disk combination, uh, which in the previous slide uh, will be the SWU or it can be a part of the bootloader, in which case the SWU here on the previous slide will be a part of the boot. Uh, in case there is no reboot required, it's either the common user space application or some trusted application running off of the trusted application zone. Um, and um, that's much of the unknown as of now, but that's probably the best thing, uh, but we'll get to that. Also, um, despite the fact that double copy LDA, or in terms of Android, uh, the AB style updates, uh, although they take more space, they have some advantages uh, that are very important in terms of security, and that is self-recovery. Uh, you always have at least one working version that you can roll back to. Uh, also, with some additional security measures and precautions, it's possible to not download the whole package completely. And if you have a trusted channel, uh, you can download it in chunks and apply it in chunks. And that's important if you have serious RAM constraints. Okay, so that's the ODA part. Uh, now, up to the next abbreviation, XIP. XIP stands for execute in place. Uh, that's a software technology that allows the code to be executed directly from persistent storage. Historically, that was NorFlash. Uh, now there's also QSPI type of flash that also allows for execution directly from itself. Um, when we're talking XIP, we're talking kernel XIP first and foremost, and in this case, and in case we have uh, a double copy LTA method applied, uh, the flash that allows for execution would contain a bootloader and two kernels, the first one and the reserve one, and uh, the application root file system, databases and whatnot, uh, will then most likely be on a NAND flash or EMMC or something else, some other storage uh, that you cannot run programs directly from, but that's actually not necessary. Uh, it's gonna be a little more complicated uh, if we want the 
application file system to be XIP, at least in part, then we should move it to uh, the flash that allows for XIP execution. And uh, this makes the design slightly more expensive, but we do save on RAM in this case. Um, and yeah, we'll pass over to other XIP advantages. As I've said, uh, the first one is that we don't have the need to uh, deploy a lot of DRAM. Usually RAM footprint is up to 10 times smaller than if we don't use the XIP technology. Uh, and there also are some advanced designs uh, when no DRAM is used at all. It's all, only the flash uh, where the XIP uh, partitions are located and then some SRAM rather small one, uh, to run programs off of uh, for those kinds of programs that cannot be run directly from Flash. Uh, also, what's important, uh, especially in battery-powered IoT devices that have to work uh, in locations that are complicated to access, is lower power consumption in idle state. Because for DRAM, there is also some power leakage. You have to uh, maintain the circuits that are used uh, in DRAM. Uh, you have to spend power basically in vain uh, to maintain DRAM operation. If we can reduce DRAM, sometimes it can make a lot of difference for devices that have to run for months on a single battery charge. And also, if implemented properly, uh, XIP can also give shorter boot time because you don't have to copy uh, code uh, from flash to RAM. And in case of a fast QSPI flash, it's also the faster execution. With that said, obviously, uh, if everything were just shiny and bright, everyone would have been using XIP happily, and there would be no need for a talk like this. So there are still uh, obstacles that are native to XIP technologies, um, and we have to list them too. So the first, uh, first one is that you can't really write to Flash and execute from it at the same time. Uh, due to the nature of Flash writes, uh, if we issue a command to write a flash, then it becomes non-readable for a time being. And in this case, uh, execution has to happen from some other place, be that RAM or SRAM or maybe some code that is locked in cache. That's the different story. But still, you cannot write a flash and execute from it at the same time. Also, we are very used to having kernels compressed and stored on flash storage, uh, having been compressed on front. That is not gonna work with XIP. The code, at least, should be uncompressed because otherwise it cannot be directly executed. And also, all addresses for execution should be defined at compile time and compiled in because otherwise it's not gonna work. You cannot modify anything on Flash. So uh, basically, if we're running a certain kernel, then all the addresses are known up front. Uh, so there cannot be any randomization of addresses and this may be a security compromise. So when we pass over to OTA and XIP working together, we need to keep in mind that XIP as such can potentially lower the security. So security itself becomes even more important. So ODA and XIP, why do we talk about those two together? What's the point? And the point is that they actually pursue the same goals. XIP technology as its main features, it gives a smaller footprint for RAM 
and faster boot. And smaller footprint of RAM uh, means less idle power consumption, which is important for remote IoT. And faster boot is important for automotive, as well as faster execution, because you really don't want to uh, have your multimedia car system start for five minutes, uh, as the first Android ones did. Uh, and when it comes to ODA, uh, its main features are easy maintenance, which contributes to remote IoT a lot. So if you have easier maintenance for IoT devices that are hard to access, that's an important thing that will simplify the maintenance quite a bit. And ODA makes it more convenient and cost-effective and customer-friendly uh, when it comes to update uh, of the automotive stuff. So there are two major appliances uh, that both XIP and OTA make better. But, once again, not everything is shiny and bright. Because if we're doing XIP, uh, that's a very fine technology in the sense that if you do something wrong, uh, the chances are high uh, that you break something. So fail safety is crucial because it's easier to break a device and also, as I've said, uh, it's actually easier to do something uh, that poses a security threat. Uh, also, um, if we're talking about memory constraint system, and if we're not talking about memory constraint system, uh, then XIP is not that important. But if we do talk about memory constraint system, then integral update may not fit uh, and then uh, we will have to deal with the double copy mechanism. Uh, and then we'll go over to how double copy mechanisms, the existing ones, according to the classification that we did before, uh, how those mechanisms are actually working with XIP. And, well, spoiler, not that well. So, um, going to skip this slide. I'm going to back to it. So, um, the user space ODA, which is basically what most of the FOSS updaters do, uh, is very simple uh, when we don't consider XIP. So, uh, if we implement double copy user space ODA, uh, it's basically a common application that does some security checks and then updates the kernel and the user space which are not active at the moment. And then you reboot and you reboot into the new kernel and new user space. But in case we're dealing with XIP, as you can see on the picture, both kernels uh, going to be located in flash. So the kernel A cannot execute during uh, the kernel B update, even though kernel B is itself inactive. So uh, you have to disable interrupts and preemption uh, during uh, every single flash write, and it's going to cause significant interruptions of service. And if we're dealing with the user space that's also XIP, uh, then we cannot execute uh, directly from Flash uh, using the updater too. So both the updater and all the libraries that it uses should be copied to RAM uh, before we can start the update. And this makes the whole thing quite a bit complicated. Then if we go in a couple of slides back and uh, discuss the initrd based over the air updates is going to be looking a lot brighter because all this updater stuff uh, it doesn't have to be xip you know the kernel plus the rom disk 
the ones that we were talking about in a single copy update description, they don't have to be XIP. So you just load them into memory, you know, you as a bootloader, on reboot, you load them into memory, pass the execution to those, and they do the update. So this one actually works with XIP pretty well. But on the other hand, using single copy updater with XIP is a potential threat. So I think we're ending up in some kind of weird state. So there is something that works, but we, we don't want it to, to be deployed, and there is something that we want to be deployed, but it doesn't seem to work. Uh, bootloader ODA, uh, just for the record, is pretty much uh, the same as the kernel plus in it or deep, but a little worse. I'm not going to spend time on this. If you want, we can take it as a question. So then we go back to user space ODA. And we know it's not that good for XIP system. But if we go one step further and implement updater, well, at least for ARM we can do that. If we implement updater as a trusted application running in trust zone, then it's going to work pretty well because you pass the whole execution to this real updater running in a trust zone and it creates some additional security, creates some additional safety because it's not easy to tamper with that type of software. And at the same time, it, since it's been uh, clear that it's gonna work from RAM, uh, the situation uh, where uh, you have to copy too much data to RAM to be able to run a certain application uh, is not applicable here because in this case, uh, the updater plus the trusted OS will be self-contained. The problem here, however, is that there is no uh, free and open source solution that uses this method, even though uh, there are some in progress. Um, we, we are working on this, but we're not there yet. Okay, so um, summarizing everything, what can we say? Uh, XIP execute and place technology can add value to uh, systems using OTA solutions, but it also adds complexity that uh, has to be taken into account. And also XIP puts certain specific requirements on updaters, uh, which may not be easy to fulfill sometimes. Existing free and open source updaters, therefore, don't play that well together with XIP. Secure updates within the trust zone should be working fine, but there are no known solutions for that yet. So we have something to work on, basically. And yeah, that's it. Um, my presentation is over, so if you have any questions, please. Yes? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. You, you still, you, you run the updater in RAM in case of trust zone, but you, you, lo you load it and it's self-contained. So uh, you, you, uh, it's, it's easier to make it work because uh, you don't have to uh, consider all the possible links to libraries that actually reside on an XIP file system. Well, trust, trust zone um, gonna gonna con running something in a trust zone gonna consume more power, but um, it's not. I mean, this is not a, a frequent case when you update for an IoT device. Let's suppose uh, 
there, there, are, there are devices, you know, somewhere, somewhere in between the ceiling and, uh, and the floor, uh, you know, that hard, hard to access. Um, uh, and and those, those devices uh, supposedly get updates like once per year. Yeah, but, but the, there is a spike, but that's okay. Any other questions? And thank you for your attention. <laughs>